See, this month we've been talking about the fact that all over the world, people know Jesus as so many different things. You know, you can talk to an atheist and they view Jesus as a historical figure and they're kind of hoping he gets forgotten because he's quite annoying to them. If, if you talk to somebody that's maybe, maybe a, a Buddhist, they'll look at Jesus as being a historical religious figure, but he's not necessarily somebody who should be totally worshipped. If you look to a Muslim, a devout Muslim will tell you that Jesus was a prophet, but he's definitely not the Messiah. If you, if you talk to a Jewish person, they'll probably tell you that Jesus was a prophet, but he definitely wasn't the Messiah as promised in the Old Testament. So depending on who you are, you're going to look at Jesus different. If, if you're here today and you call yourself a follower of Christ, the reality is you probably look at Jesus a little bit different than your neighbor. Every week it seems like I... I have conversations with individuals where they'll share with me their opinions about Jesus, God, the Bible. And it's always amazing how different people think different things. You know, we're no different than they were 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, there's a story we're going to pick up here in just a moment in, in Mark. Where Jesus is traveling around with his disciples. And they take a break, and they're, I, I believe it's a campfire kind of moment. They're sitting around with Jesus. you got these 12 guys. And Jesus throws out this question of, who do people say that I am? And in that moment, you get all these opinions, just a, a litany of opinions. Kind of like you would. If, if I said, who is Jesus to you? You, you probably would give me a, a bunch of different sayings. The disciples were no different. And we pick up in Mark chapter 8, verse 27. It says this, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? All right, here's their chance. They're going to get to unload, get it off their chest. Well, okay, Jesus, I've been dying to say it, but people have been talking. We've heard people talking, and now we're going to tell you what they say because, doggone it, it's kind of been eating at me. Because I believe the disciples weren't 100% sold out yet. In verse 28, it says, they replied, some say John the Baptist. We talked about that the first week. We talked about how John the Baptist and Jesus were very similar. John the Baptist was all about repentance, and here comes Jesus, all about repentance as well, except Jesus was a little bit different. He was all about repentance through grace. And then it goes on, the next one says, next one chimes in and goes, others say that you're Elijah. Elijah? Well, why would they say Elijah? Well, it depends. Uh, most of the people at that time saw Elijah as a superhero. We talked about that last week. And I, I know that I messed y'all up last week. There were people fighting on the way out of church on who would win in a fight between Superman and Batman. I went to Poncho's because everybody goes to Poncho's. And you could hear people around the dinner table at Poncho's fighting about superheroes and who was the most powerful. Y'all, let it go. Everybody knows it's Batman. Gosh. So we talked about Elijah and how Elijah was a superhero because he did all these miracles. And then Jesus shows up and blows away his record of miracles. It's a cool story. Great, great things were happening. Well, then the next person chimes in. I wish I knew who said what, but we don't. But the next guy chimes in and says, and still others say that you're just one of the prophets. One of the prophets. Now, why a prophet? You know, a prophet is one of those words in today's vernacular, if you will. Prophet is one of those words where, you know, people kind of look at it and go, uh, people have abused that word. Every time you think of prophet, you think of weirdos and wackos. And trust me, there's many of those. Why a prophet? Why would they say a prophet? Well, let me, let me teach. Can I teach you for a second? I, I want you to walk out today and go, I'm smarter today. Some of you need it wearing orange. I want you to be able to walk out and say, I feel educated. So let me help you out this morning. Why a prophet? Well, there were 48 prophets and seven prophetesses named in the Bible, okay? Most of those in the Old Testament. And there were actually, if, if you really look at his, historical records, there were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophets throughout the Old Testament. But then something happened. It all stopped. It all stopped. Everything stopped. It stopped for 400 years. And for 400 years, there were zero prophets giving prophetic words. For 400 years. So they go from having this culture where people are speaking about God and speaking on behalf of God, and God is speaking to his people through these prophets, and then all of a sudden, silence for 400 years. That is until Jesus. 
That is until Jesus shows up on the scene and breaks that 400-year tradition. It's until Jesus steps in and goes, everybody recognizes there's a new guy on the, in, in the town. In Luke chapter 24, verse 19, we see it saying, And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus showed up on the scene as a prophet and got everybody's attention. It's not just Christians that believe that. You study other religions, and other religions will refer to Jesus as a prophet. But I feel like we kind of need to, I think we need to go a little bit deeper than that. See, Jesus was the first prophet in more than 400 years, and that was a big deal because the prophet had two very important roles. Now, please understand, I, I, have a, I have a wide range of people, and that's not a fat joke by any means, but I've got different people in the room. I've got some people in this room that are really big in studying the prophetic things in the Bible. I have some people in this room that go, what is a prophet? So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to land in the middle this morning, and I, I want to teach you some things, but I want to keep it very simple this morning. See, the prophet was a big deal because he had two. Everybody say two. Oh, come on. Y'all are falling asleep on it. Everybody say two. There were two specific roles the prophet had. The first, a prophet speaks of the future. Write that down. A prophet speaks of the future. See, in the Old Testament, as noted in Deuteronomy, the principle was that a true prophet would be known by prophesying something that would happen soon. This way people would know his words were true. So he would speak of things to come. Uh, let me kind of put that into perspective because I don't know what your background is. You might be thinking like a tarot card reader or a psychic. No, not necessarily. Those, those, are, those are scams. I'm talking about declaring something that was outlandish. Let me, let, me, let me explain to you why that happened. It would be as if I walked in here and I said, Hey, friends, First Assembly, I want to teach you something today. Most of you have been taught that there were three parts of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and what? The Holy Spirit. But I am here to declare to you that there is a fourth part that you have not been told about. And his name is Bubba. Let that sink into your spirit this morning. Bubba is the fourth part of the Trinity. I can't tell you his role because it's kind of crazy. But Bubba is the fourth part of the Trinity. I know what you're thinking this morning. You're thinking, that preacher done lost his mind. So let me help you out. I'm going to prophesy something so that you know it's true. Okay? I prophesy this morning that Tennessee will beat Alabama this past game. No, that didn't happen. Oh, wow. Okay, so what happens is, is I make a false prophecy, and because that prophecy didn't come true, you know what you get to do? You get to pick up rocks and throw them at me. Which is why we didn't hand them out to you while you came in. See, in the Bible, whenever, whenever the prophet would make a false prophecy, they killed him. They would throw rocks at him. I don't know. There's times. I, how many of you have somebody you'd like to throw a rock at? Don't lie. Got a few people I'd to, like to chunk at. I'm just saying. They got to throw rocks because he was wrong. And if he was wrong in his prophecy, then the words he was speaking were lies as well. The prophet's job was to speak about things to come so that he could justify and quantify the words that he was saying. Jesus made 29, hear that? Look at 29 in three years. He made 29 short-term prophecies that were all fulfilled within three years of ministry. 29. If you read the New Testament, he specifically made 29 prophecies in just the New Testament, in three years. Now, that doesn't include all the others that were based on heaven and the end times and all that other stuff. These prophecies were made to prove Jesus knew what he was talking about. Jesus made these prophecies. He didn't, he didn't have to. Jesus didn't have to make those prophecies. He made them so that it would prove that what he was saying as a prophet was true. See, a prophet speaks of the future, but only, 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 only to validate their other role. See, their other role is a prophet speaks about the Father. A prophet speaks about the Father. Jesus made a lot of short-term prophecies that have come true in order to prove this validity of his words 2,000 years ago. But they're also the words that are valid today. See, 
when, when Jesus began to speak about the Father, because that's what a prophet does, he speaks on behalf of God. When Jesus began to speak on behalf of the Father, he was doing something really unique. He was revealing his nature. Write that down. He was revealing his nature. And when I say his, I put a capital H because we're talking about God. He is revealing the very nature of God. Why is that important? Because at that time, people had kind of a, an unfair view of God. Back before Jesus, if you look, if you read the Old Testament, which is, if you're, if you're new to the Bible, let me just encourage you, don't start in the Old Testament, start in the New Testament. But if you jump into the Bible, you kind of see this picture being painted about who God is, that he is ruthless, that he is callous, that he is harsh, he is stern, and all those, those things are true, and it's not necessarily a bad thing to be afraid of God, there needed to be some balance. A lot of people ask, you know, Pastor, why, why do we see such a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Let me kind of make it very simple. All right, this is a simple way of looking. How many of you have had children or know somebody that has children? That should be all of you. Everybody knows kids. How many of you know when a baby is small, and we've all had small babies, that, that a lot of times you've got to really watch out for those kids? You know, Pastor Dan and uh, Miss Sarah, they brought so much joy to our home. And one of those joys was they brought in their little baby. Uh, eight, eight, nine months. How old is that kid? Nine month old, 150 pound child. Man child. Well, in, in, the, in the short time that they, they stayed with us, Corbin started to crawl. And how many of you know when kids start crawling, it's a whole new world, new fantastic point of view. This child all of a sudden went, forced us to start looking at our home going, uh-oh. Uh, okay, we got to make sure he doesn't go over there. He's going towards a plug. Stop it. Pow! He's got a knife. Stop it. Pow! Why? Because they're kids. And as a child, you have to, like, stay on them. It was so funny because we, many of you have been to our home. You, you know, we have a two-story house, and we live on the top story, which is kind of weird when you say it that way. But you'd set the baby down, and you'd be like, hey, how you doing? Uh-oh, where'd he go? Oh, oh, Jesus. Because you're afraid he's going where to the stairs, so you hover over him. Oh, stop it. Oh, don't do that. Oh. And you do that, and you do that for years and years and years and years. And then something happens. They grow up. And then it doesn't go as much as that intensity that you had when they were babies. Now you start giving them freedom. Now you start allowing them to mess up more. Now you start removing your hands of protection so they can make their mistakes. And then as they get even older and start preparing to move out, you start as a parent, or you should as a parent, be sitting back watching going, mm, that's stupid, but I love you. You know, we've just recently made sure, are any of our kids in here? Nope. Okay. Um, one of my, my oldest son has started this new thing where he's wanting to do his hair. And he's got awful designs. I don't even understand it. And uh, when they were a kid, how many of you know, when you, when you have kids, you do their hair, right? And then they start getting older and you let them do their hair. Right? You start removing, I hope you're not doing your teenagers hair. Teenagers, if your parents are doing your hair, tell them to stop. It's weird. <laughs> Why am I telling you all that? Because that's what the Bible is. When you look at the Old Testament, if, if you look at the big picture, the Old Testament is how, is how God is taking care of these, these new babies. He's very stern. He's very harsh. Slaps the hand when it's going towards something that's going to hurt them. He's very intense. But then you see in the New Testament, it's almost like he's parenting a teenager or an older, a, a young adult or something. Because there's a lot more grace involved. There's a lot more leeway. There's a lot more gray area so that we can learn and we can grow. And if you look at the scripture as a whole, you see this fatherly nature, because we know that the Bible declares God is our father. We see this fatherly nature from birth through life. We've got to look at the big picture. And it's important to understand that when Jesus revealed some stuff in the New Testament about God, it was some life-changing things. We're not talking about he's, he's revealing how God, you know, stands up and touches his nose. We're not talking about silly. We're not talking about what Jesus is... Jesus is revealing what the Father's hobbies were. We're talking about he's revealing the very nature of God. And one of the first things that he reveals is that God is a giver. Write that down. He reveals that God is a giver. Matthew 7, 11 says, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask them? 
God is a giver. And Jesus shows up on the scene and is declaring to everybody, listen, God is not in heaven trying to take from you. And you may be sitting here going, well, duh. Let me be honest. I've done enough funerals in my lifetime. I've done enough counseling sessions in my lifetime to hear the hearts of people sitting on the other cross of the de- other side of the desk or to be sitting out in the, the congregation or the sitting area during a funeral to know that when people have a loss, the person they blame it on is a big man upstairs. That when something unfair happens, when, when a job is lost or a, a loved one passes away or somebody gets sick, that there's this innate nature inside of us that says, oh no, God is taken from me. God has robbed me. God has taken a good relationship. God has taken my family. God has taken my health. God has taken my loved ones. And Jesus comes in and goes, no, no, it's not true. God is a giver. God wants to give you good things. God wants you to have good things. God cares about you enough that he wants to give to you because you're his children. I don't know a parent alive. Let me rephrase that. I don't know a good parent who doesn't want to give things to their kids. Who doesn't look forward to blessing them. Why? Because we care, don't we? Second thing that Jesus revealed is that God is caring. God is caring. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, duh, we, we know that God is caring. Keep in mind the culture that he's talking to. The culture that only understands that harsh side of God. And he's saying, guys, listen. Your heavenly father, he cares about you. See, in Matthew 6, 26, it says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Do you not realize that if if, if your father cares about everything else, that he cares about you even more? Friends, let me tell you this morning. um, There's people in this room. Do you feel like God doesn't care about you? I didn't plan on going here, but let me just take a second. Hey, listen, I know where some of you have come from. Most of you have heard my story and the the hell that I grew up in. That God just miraculously wraps his arms around me and says, Hey, Jeremy, I love you. I care for you. There's people in this room this morning that you don't feel like God cares about you. That God even knows that you're here this morning. Can 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 I just take a time out and just make it very plain and simple? God cares more about you than anything else on this earth. More than birds, more than trees, more than the wells in the sea. He cares about you. And you may not know that yet, but please hear me. I believe that you'll learn it soon. Because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to reveal that to us today. That God cares about us. Why does he give? Why does he care? Because the third thing that Jesus revealed is that God is love. God is love. Now... Everybody looks at love a little bit different. You know, love to two teenagers that are, you know, pubescent sounds like this. <gasps> what are you doing? <laughs> you smell nice. <laughs> and for four hours on a phone or texting nonstop, the same question over and over and over and over again. That's love. But yet somebody who's been married for years, they see love in a different way. Some, once you've had children, you love them in a different way. Once you have that pet that just, oh my gosh, it grabs your heart. You know, I thought my mom loved me when I was growing up until she became an empty nester and bought a dog. And then I saw what true love was about. Because that stupid dog gets to do things I was never allowed to do. And I know there's people in this room that you may not have children, your children have gone. But you do understand a pet, an unhealthy Love for pet. That's between you and God, whatever. But regardless, all of us in this room, in some way, form, or fashion, have experienced love. But see, that generation didn't understand that God is love. They saw God as a policeman out to stop. Don't do that. You're in trouble. Fire and brimstone. That, that group of people, that's the only way they understood God. And there's many people in here, that's the way you view God as well. That God is simply a policeman out to get us, to catch us doing something wrong. But God declares, no, no, I am love. John 17 says, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. 
What he's talking about is the very, very nature of love of God is wanting to be in you. It's crazy to think. It's crazy to think that God loves you and that he wants to show his love through you. Because let's be honest, our nature is mean. If you've ever been around children, you know their nature is just mean. If you've ever been around little boys, you know they don't have to be taught to be mean. They're just mean. We went to a, a, a Halloween party that some people at our kids' school was throwing on. We thought it would be a great, great opportunity to go meet some people in the community, and it was awesome. We had a great time, got to meet a lot of folks. But yet, on, on the way there, kids are dressed up in their playful Halloween costume. We've got a ninja. One of them's a ninja, and he's got, like, swords and things all in his back, and he's ready to go. But all that was was a target for his two brothers who came up behind him. Next thing you know, everybody's got a plastic sword and it has broken loose in the Godwin house. They're hitting each other, slapping each other with swords. Why? Because we are naturally born that way. We're born aggressive. We're born with that nature. But yet God comes in and says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to supersede that because I'm love. I want you to know how much I love you. I want, you, I want others to know my love. God revealed the giving nature of God, the caring nature of God, the loving nature of God. But he also did another very important thing. See, prophets had a role to reveal who God is. But they also had another role to declare God's purpose. To declare God's purpose. See, to understand Jesus' purpose is to understand God's purpose. Let me, let me say that one more time. To understand Jesus' purpose is to understand God's purpose. It's his son. So we have to look at what, what was Jesus declaring? What, what was the message? What was the overarching message that Jesus wanted to simplify? Because that culture knew nothing but legalism and laws. And Jesus comes in and says, hey, let me tell you what me and the Father are all about. Let me, let me just go ahead and make it simple. Let me tell you what it's all about. A couple things. Number one. I am here to save the lost. I'm not here to be some deity. I'm not here to have people bow down and worship me so I feel good about myself. I'm here to do something very, very simple, and that is to save the lost. What do you mean by the lost? Well, different people use it in different ways. Here at our church, we use the statement, unchurched, dechurched. People that don't have a growing, healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. Luke 9, 10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He's out looking for him. Jesus comes in and declares, listen, you've heard about the Roman deities that, that people worship. You've heard about the bell prophets. You've heard about all these things. Let me tell you what I'm here to do. I'm not here so that people will come and bow down and worship me. I don't have a God complex. Jesus says the opposite. I came to seek and find the hurting, the hopeless, the sick. I came to find them because I love them, because God loves them. The purpose is so simple, to save the lost. But number two, there was another purpose. The second purpose of, of God, shown through Jesus, is to give abundant life. Now, abundant life, I talked about abundance not too long ago. You know, people have kind of abused that. You know, they've, they've kind of twisted it and made it into something it's not. Let, let, me, let me simplify it. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Why is he saying that? Because you've got to understand, the majority of the people that Jesus was talking to were farmers. They were suppressed and oppressed by the Roman rule. They were beat down. They had no hope. They had no options. And Jesus comes in and says, listen, I know that you feel miserable. You're living off the Rome, by the Roman rule, they're beating you, they're abusing you, they're throwing you into prison, they're taxing you in such a way you can't afford. Kind of sounds like America. But it's rough. It's rough. Your life stinks. I know. But it's okay because I am here so you can have abundant life. Well, golly. Praise the Lord. Jesus is here to give us abundant life. Now, I don't have the time to really explain what all that means. But let me just make it very simple for you this morning. Jesus said something on behalf of God. He declared, I want people to have a great life. I want you to have fun. I want you to wake up and enjoy life. I don't want you to go through life and go, I hate this. 
When's this going to end? Jesus is saying, no, listen, God wants you to enjoy life. Now, you may be here today and go, well, pastor, that's easy to say, but my life stinks. Okay? Jesus can fix that. Because let me tell you something. My life stunk, too. My life was a mess. I was hopeless. I had no options. But Jesus stepped in. And Jesus has given me a life that I believe is more abundant than I deserve. I was thinking about this morning just the fact that I have an incredible family. And I'm an incredible church. I don't view this as a job. This is, this is my dream. I love the life that God has blessed me with. But let me, let me be very clear. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve, I don't deserve to have a wife that's waiting on me when I come home from work. I don't deserve to have three beautiful, healthy kids. I don't deserve, I don't deserve to have anything. But the word of God says that my heavenly father wants me to have abundant life. Because it shows his grace of what I did not deserve. He blessed me with. And I don't know what you're going through today. But I do know this. That regardless of how hopeless or empty life may feel. Jesus has a purpose. And that is to give you life. A fulfilled and happy fun life. If you allow him to. Jesus declared God's purpose. To save the lost. To give abundant life. And one more thing. Probably one of the most important things. Is to give direction. To give direction. Why? Were there a bunch of people that just were in need of GPS units back then? I mean, were they just running around, walking into walls? I mean, why in the world would Jesus come to declare direction? Because their world was no different than ours. They had a lot of confusion. You know, the truth is, I'm really glad you're here today. But you could go to about one of the other 4,000 churches in Columbia, and you'd probably hear a different message. You could go to one of the other churches and hear from their pastor, and you'd probably hear something totally different. I'm not here to say who's right and who's wrong, but I'm here to say that there's a lot of things being talked about. Jesus' world was no different. The, the time that Jesus came was no different. So he came and he summed it up. He said, listen, I know everybody's trying to figure this out. In fact, most of you are so confused that you think you just have to obey the laws and if you obey the laws, life's going to be great. Let me ask you a question, friends. If you obey all the laws that America gives us to obey, are you going to have a fulfilled life? No. Last time I checked, just because I kept from speeding, the police officer did not give me a new vehicle. Although that would be cool. No, it's not about laws. It's not about legalism. Jesus comes and declares, listen, I'm going to give you the direction. I'm going to simplify. I'm going to make it very easy. If you know anything about your pastor, you know that I will get lost trying to find my way out of a paper bag. I cannot get around. for. I hate it when people go, hey, pastor, you coming to here? Yeah, I'm coming there. Well, let me give you directions. You turn left and right, and then you know that road. It goes by five names. You make a circle on it. and then come. I just smile and nod because I don't know what you're saying. It took me a week to figure out how just to get to the church. From my house. Y'all can judge me if you want. But I have guns and motorcycles. And you can't have my man card. I just can't do directions. So I have a GPS. Everywhere I go. I need it because. I, I need somebody to simplify. Don't give me 500 turns. To get to the restaurant. Make it easy for me. And now it's so easy. There's this little girl shoved into my phone named Siri. And she talks to me sweet. She doesn't make me feel dumb because I don't know where I'm going. It's like, it's like just a great little lady in there. And she goes, oh, you need to turn left now. Oh, thank you. Versus, hey, idiot, you missed the turn. You know, she's just sweet. And she makes it so easy and so simple. You know, everybody tries to complicate life. Everybody tries to complicate religion and Christianity and all that. It's too complicated. So Jesus comes down and he declares, hey, let me simplify this. Let me tell you what God wants you to know. I've proven it by all my, all my prophecies that have come true. I've earned the right to tell you what I'm about to say. You can disagree with me you, all you want, but I've earned the right to say this. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
You can try legalism. You can try to be a good person. You can try to go to church and be faithful. You can do whatever you want. to. You can give all your money to charity. You can be the greatest person that has ever lived. But it's not enough. Let me simplify it. You don't earn your way to heaven. You come through me. You don't earn your way to go to the Father. You come through me. You don't earn a relationship with God the Father. You go through me. And he simplified it. Now, I'm a simple kind of guy. I needed it simplified. And Jesus did that for us. There's a couple people here this morning. I'm closing. There's a couple people here this morning that when I say things like God is a giver, God is caring, God is love, You don't feel like you know that God. You don't feel like you can relate to that God. You may be here this morning and feel like that God doesn't care, give, and love you. Can I just can I just shoot you straight? He does. Despite you. Did you hear that? That God gives to those who are his. He cares for all of you. He loves you despite you. Despite me, because we don't deserve it. This morning, I don't want to. I don't want to embarrass anybody. And I'm not going to. But I have to ask the question: Do you know that God? Because that's what it's all about. That's the whole reason Jesus came was so that He could make a way to the Father. Because all of this stuff that we do, all this church mess, all this, all the politics in church, none of that matters. It's all about a relationship with Jesus. It's all about a relationship with your father. It's all about having a relation. Are you hearing me? I can't declare it any other way. It's so simplistic. It's about having a relationship. And there's people in this room, you don't understand relationship because you've been abandoned. You've been abused. You've been hurt. You've been let down. You've been rejected. But today, Jesus wants you to know that your father's not going to abandon you. He's not going to reject you. He's not going to let you down. He's not going to turn his back on you. He's not going to give up on you. Because God is love. And he loves you. I want to close like this. Guys, this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. Before we can go any further, I've I've got some other business things that we need to do here in a minute. But before we go any further, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me ask you a question. This morning, we talk about God is love, and God loves you, and God has a relationship with you, Philip. God cares about you. God longs to, to be with you. God longs to have a relationship with you. And you may be here today, and you've, all you know is church. All you know is religion, and all you, all you really can relate to is the legalism of church in America. I'm not saying church is bad. Church is a great thing. But church is very simply a conduit for us to share the love of God with one another and with people in our community. When it's all said and done, what it's all about is a relationship. You know, they sat around that campfire. They talked about all the different things that God, I'm sorry, all the different things that Jesus was being called. He was called the John the Baptist, some thought he was John the Baptist, some thought he was Elijah, some thought he was a prophet because he revealed something to God. He revealed something about God in those three short years of ministry. I in no way claim to be a prophet, but I am here to reveal something to you. And that is that God is love. And that God longs to have a relationship with you despite what you may think about him, despite what hurt you may harbor inside Despite what your past may look like, I want to reveal something very simple that God is love and that he wants a relationship with you. So with that being said, with every head bowed and every eye closed, let me just simply ask you this morning, whether you've been here a hundred times or you're a guest, it doesn't matter. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to have a relationship with God. I've tried on my own. I've tried to make it work on my own. But when it's all said and done, I just simply need a relationship with my heavenly father. If that's you today, I'm just going to simply ask you to raise your hand right where you're at. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to bring you a mic. 
is a moment between you and God. If that's you, you'd say, Pastor, I just want to, I want to have a relationship with my father. Doesn't mean you join the church. Doesn't mean you're committing to anything. You're just committing to a relationship. One that'll be growing the rest of your life. If that's you, will you just lift up your hand right where you're at? Nobody looking around. Just you mean God. I see that hand, bro. All right, who else? Come on, if that's you, just slip up your hand. Let me pray with you. Anybody else? One last chance. Pastor, I want to have a relationship with my Heavenly Father. If that's you, just lift up your hand. All right. Can we pray together this morning? The, the Bible tells us that it's by the word of our testimony. It's, yeah, we open our mouth and pray. But it's not that there's power necessarily in the words we're saying. The power comes in the heart that's longing for a relationship. So this morning, before we go any further, can you, can you do me a favor and let's, let's pray with those that raise their hand. Dear Jesus, oh, come on, pray that way. Dear Jesus, I know I'm not perfect. In fact, I'm a sinner. But that's why I need you. I need a relationship. It goes beyond religion. I want to know you, Jesus. And I want to know my Father. Come into my heart. And wipe away my past. Because today, I'm making a fresh start. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just lift up a hand clap of praise?